uh, we're going to get into and talk about uh, viscoelasticity. So you're all experts now in uh, basically looking at our, we're still, again, we're still in regime one in our stress strain curves. So you know how to deal with isotropic, linear elastic materials, uh, specifically cubic materials. So you could solve any problem there. We delved into a little bit about anisotropic. I misspelled that for sure. But anisotropic materials, again, where the Young's modulus and other mechanical properties will change depending on the direction and uh, kind of orientation of your material. Uh, and we're going to come back to this uh, a little bit, and specifically an orthorhombic material that we could treat it like that uh, when we get to kind of composites. But that's uh, in the next lecture. Um, however, we've kind of ignored one of the key and um, kind of cool part about uh, basically polymeric materials, which is uh, all these theories. Did we ever mention temperature, time, or any kind of rates? So strain rates, shear strain, um, engineering strain rates, you know, stress, you know, basically stress rates? No, all of these models, all these continuum isotropic linear elastic materials, anisotropic linear elasticity, we have treated them independently of time, rate, and temperature. But polymers, as we've seen in our kind of silly putty model, uh, they very much, their mechanical properties will change a lot depending on the time scales and rate at which you know, we saw our Debro number, the, our characteristic relaxation time over your experimental time scales. So we know that our Debro number, time scales are really, really important in terms of whether our material behaves as a viscous material, a solid material, or a viscoelastic material. Uh, so, and then also we've seen from our kind of silly putty model, depending on how fast the strain rate at which we pull it, it could fracture or it could flow like a uh, material. And also, if you put a polymer in liquid nitrogen and then throw, you know, silly putty in liquid nitrogen and throw it against the wall, it'll shatter. So again, temperature dependent mechanical properties will change a lot as well. Um, and specifically, most polymers will behave uh, basically viscoelastically um, and actually linear viscoelasticity. Uh, and that's the deformation. Uh, it's kind of this behavior, you know, viscoelasticity has kind of two terms. In it. So visco, which is like this viscous, kind of fluid-like response, and then elastic, which is, again, this kind of solid-like right, -like response, this reversible response. So most polymers will behave kind of somewhat elastically and somewhat like a viscous fluid. And it's going to change depending on, again, these times, as we're going to see in uh, the lecture, uh, this lecture, times, rate, and uh, temperatures. Um, so again, visco is going to be this time component, and then elasticity will be this, this idea of reversibility. So we basically will have kind of two different types of responses. Um, so polymers will behave elastically at low temperatures and high strain uh, rates. Um, but at high temperatures and low strain rates, they're gonna behave more like a viscous fluid. So those are kind of the key uh, distinctions there. So when temperature is high and strain rate is low, viscous response. Uh, if actually strain rate and also basically like kind of the frequency of omega. If my temperature is very, very low and my strain rates are high, I'm going to get an elastic response. So if it behaves elastically, again, we have kind of those relationships as well. Again, much more complex, not just Hooke's law. Uh, but if we have a viscous fluid, again, uh, our Newton's law that we kind of uh, all the way back in basically lecture kind of five, very important lecture as well. Not important lecture four, uh, but still very, very important. So again, you get this kind of flow type of behavior. Um, and so this linear viscoelasticity, it describes a lot of the mechanical responses for polymers, glasses, cells, tissues, biomaterials. A lot of materials will behave like a viscoelastic material. So we know that for viscous fluid, when there's basically no recovery, uh, when that shear stress is removed, again, we get flow. So no recovery, our material will flow. And you could kind of imagine, again, our plates here. I have a fluid in between them by kind of keep this plate you know constant here and I pull here I'm going to get uh, actually if I pull in the I keep this kind of constant here I'm going to get a flow pattern like this this and then this so that kind of my sounds flow again you know this relationship hopefully from your fluid mechanics courses uh, again right here we've seen this kind of uh, before again our fluid viscosity not again <laughs> and then our shear strain rate here uh, and it's going to be linear because again there's this proportional increase in stress for uh, some strain at some time and temperature. Now, one of the ways, and we're getting into this in the next video, one of the ways that we can kind of model 
the uh, viscoelastic behavior materials is using kind of this uh, combinations of springs and dash pots. Um, and we're going to take a look next time or in the next video uh, at the Maxwell model and the Voigt model and then the standard uh, linear elastic model and see where these uh, where these models can capture behavior, where they fail, and then how they lead to kind of a more thorough experimental and anal empirical analysis of polymers um, that I think will give us a little bit more, or actually quite a bit more insight into how these materials are going to behave. So uh, that's uh, about it for this video. So I'll see you in the next one, and we're going to get into Maxwell, Voigt, and springs and dash pots, and all these kind of uh, models. So hopefully you remember some of your circuits and series and parallel. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks. Bye.